receive the fullness of grace that God has for us. Lord, we honor you. We bless you in these things. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the title for today's message is um, Compel, Dwell, and Occupy. Compel, Dwell, and Occupy. This is both descriptive and it's instructive. That these are the things that we ought to be moving in today. That the word compel has been dropped in my spirit for about four weeks. That it comes back to the the parable of the Great Supper and, and the different stages. But the last stage of bringing people into the kingdom of God was to go out to the highways and go out to the lanes and compel them to come to my supper. And, and this compelling. Is, is there anybody in this house that's compelling? It doesn't have to be you. Is there anybody else that's compelling? <laughs> but to, to, to be compelling means that, that I'm influential, highly influential. That we can compel by dragging and kicking and screaming, that kind of a thing. Or we can compel by our own image. We can compel by our own lifestyle. We can have a, a godly influence that draws people towards the kingdom of God. Now, how many of y'all know that we are called to be a kingdom of priests? That, that, that being a priest is part of our identity. And so what, what, do, what do godly uh, priests do? What do godly priests do? They occupy. They take up space. They dwell in a particular place. They do business. The, 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 the word said, do business. Occupy until I come. And, and how many of y'all know that God is coming? Yeah. That the Lord is coming. And so we need to be prepared for His coming. And that preparation for His coming is, is that doing business. It's occupying. It's being active in the things of God. And that God is building us up so it's more than words. It's more than just busyness. How many of y'all need more stuff to keep you busy? Michelle, no. No. Not more stuff, but we want to be effective at what we're doing. If we're doing it right, that there's some things that God will turn around and say, we're going we're gonna to take a look at a few things that will help us to, to do this. There's so many uh, tidbits that we've already gotten this morning, which is absolutely amazing. But if you have your Bible with you uh, this morning, I want you to turn to Psalm 107. It's Psalm 107. Psalm 107. And God is good. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. I, I agree. I'd rather be here than on the beach. I'd rather be here than the lake. Amen. Psalm 107, starting at verse 8. says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul and He fills the hungry soul with goodness. Amen. Man, you get hungry for goodness, God will fill you. That when you start to get into that right place and you're seeking the right things, man, God is worthy of our thanksgiving. Amen? Amen? He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our time. He is worthy of our energy. He is worthy of, of, of our godly relationships. He's worthy of, of all of these things. And when we come into a, to a place of right alignment, I love how this, this psalm uh, starts and, and, and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That we ought to come into a place of agreement with God. The redeemed are in a place of agreement with God. Uh, the agreement with the Word of God. There's some people that don't have the Word of God. And they need to hear your agreement with it. So we know and we understand where God has called us to. Verse 10 <clears throat> says, Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel. That's a strong word. They despise the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. He, they fell down, and there was none to help. This is what happens when we, find, when we fall out of the ways of God. This is what happens when we go to sleep on the kingdom of God. That as we begin to fall away, we can feel the corrective hand of God set upon our lives. And it can feel like life is just absolutely miserable. But God's not called us to misery. He's called us to something better. Amen? We get to this place, and I even said it this morning, that God, there's got to be something more to you than what I'm experiencing. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something greater for the kingdom of God. There has to be a greater uh, dispensation for my life, a greater manifestation in my life. Have you ever had that conversation with God? And every time I do, God says, well, there is. There is. There is that something more. Verse 13 
Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. He broke their chains into pieces. Oh, is that a picture of freedom? Amen. He broke their chains into pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful work to the children of men. Verse 16 says, He has broken the gates of bronze and He cuts the bars of iron in two. If we get a hold of this, there's so many things we're crying out for God to do. But when we are moving in the right place with Him, we don't have to cry out for Him to do it. God moves. God responds. And God interacts. Hallelujah. And that we're putting on this new identity in Christ. We've come to Christ. We've come to the Lord. He's turning all things around inside of our lives. But what we have to do is we've got to step out into the river. We've got to go where the water's flowing. Amen. And there is a flow to the kingdom of God. There is a rhythm to the kingdom of God. How many of y'all got rhythm today? Amen. Let me see your rhythm. Amen. But we're called to be, be priests. We're called to be kings, the priests of the Most High. And no matter what we do in life as kings and, and as priests, you're calling. You've got a calling on your life. You've got a purpose on your life. There's so many people that are out there, and, and, we, and we end up on these conversations like, I don't know what my purpose is. I, I need to know my purpose. And sometimes like, you, you need to know is God. Because when you know God, you'll know your purpose. When you know Him, He reveals the deeper things. And He's calling us to a deeper place. And you've got a purpose. Anybody here, you've got no purpose whatsoever. Because if you have no purpose whatsoever, I will purpose you before uh, you go home today. Amen. But here we are. We're in the kingdom of God. You've got to know your calling. What is your calling? You've got a calling in community. You have a calling as a, a father or as a mother, as a husband or as a wife or, or as a, a, a citizen. But whatever we do as, as priests of the Lord... Every day we seek the Lord. And every day that we seek the Lord, a seed is sown into your heart. That there is something more. God never allows us to come out of His presence empty. But He fills us up to overflowing. Amen? When you come to church and you receive a word, a seed is sown. You come today, you go and get a seed. And, and when you, you spend time with the Lord, and, and, and when you make this your lifestyle, that seed is grown and that seed is nurtured. Amen. How many of y'all are glad that our Father is a nurturer? He, he builds things up. You know, some of the, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a gardener, not a great gardener. This year is not a great year for gardening in, the, in, in my yard. But there are some things, that, and, and I'm looking at my plants, and they're withering, they're wavering left and right. So sometimes what I got to do, I got to have a stick, and I got to tie them to the stick. Right? You know, you know, don't you? Charlotte, there's some days I need to be tied to a stick. And it builds strength. And I watch the wind work. And, 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 and it's like these little plants are saying, thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your help. And I'm like, thank you for your food. <laughs> for Harvest Day is coming. Amen. And such as it is in the kingdom of God. When we are investing in the kingdom of God, I'm talking about investing your time. I'm talking about investing your relationship. I'm, I'm talking about investing all that you are. God has invested all that he is inside of you. And so when we come back and now we are investing back, it is not a waste of time. Amen. I speak that because somebody spoke it. It's a waste of time. It is not a waste of time. The time in the kingdom, of, all time belongs to God. Amen. God is outside of time. He rules over time. God controls the time. Amen. And so what you do for the kingdom of God is never a waste of time. What we have here, it's a covenant between God and man. It's documented and it's confirmed in the Word of God that we are to be built up in the Word of God and we are to build up one another and to encourage one another in the things of God. Encourage one another in the, in the, in, in the kingdom of God that, that, that sometimes, you know, you can stand there and encourage yourself with as much as what you have, but eventually your tank will run empty. And what you need is somebody to come alongside. Not somebody to fluff you up or to flatter you. You need somebody filled with the Spirit of God saying, here, I got something for you. That there's times, and I think that, that, that we go through uh, difficulties, we go through hard seasons and, and, and dry seasons, and, and what we need to hear is, is, is not just hang on, you need to hear those words like, I need you, we need you, the kingdom of God needs you, this community needs you, we need you to step up, we need you to go into that area, now go get them. A lot of times we hear, it's, it's time to pull back, just rest and just relax. There's other times and what you need is a good kick in the pants and a push out of the nest to move into that deeper thing with God. I'll tell you what, when you're servicing and you're working with the things of the kingdom of God, it will not destroy you. It may take you out for a minute, but it's going to make you stronger. Because what we do on this earth is that's temporal. That's going to pass away. 
But I'll tell you what, the things we do in the kingdom of God, that's eternal. That lasts. Amen. As, as long as it can stand the fire, as long as it can stand the test, as, as, as long as, as we do not become weary and well-doing, we will reap in due time. Amen. Amen. Somebody should have said, Amen, Pastor Dave. We've been looking at this priesthood over the last month, looking at the priesthood of the Lord, that we are our, 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 our kingdom of priests, that we are a holy priesthood set apart as unto the Lord. Amen. And so we begin to, to really understand and put on this identity. Uh, the, the calling, we talked about the calling of the priesthood. We talked about the advantages of the priesthood. Amen. We talked about this identity in the priesthood. But now uh, we want to look deeper and see the purpose of the priesthood and the power of the priesthood. The deeper purpose, the deeper power, the, the, the deeper access that we have as priests of, of the Almighty. We talk about building the altar and spending time at the altar and being refreshed at the altar and being able to put our sacrifice upon the altar and, you know, and calling down the fire of God and have that burning on the altar. And there needs to be a burning on the inside. Anybody else burning in, on, up on the inside in here? I know the AC is going and that's external, but I'm talking about what's going on on the internal. We've got to have a furnace for God. Yeah, you've, 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 you've got to be the table. You've, 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 you've got to be the fuel. You've got to be, so when, so when God says burn, you burn, amen. And we burn for the deeper things. We go after those deep. We get motivated for the deeper things of God, amen. When we pray, we pray. Jesus said, when you pray, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And under a spirit of revelation, I want you to know to understand, I want you to grab this, that when we pray for the kingdom of God to come, that you are a part of the coming of the kingdom. That, that the man, we, we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're asking for the manifestation of God's kingdom in the earth. And you are a manifestation of that kingdom. You're carrying this. Amen. And so we, we, we want you to understand that, 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 that in you is, is the hope of glory. That inside of you, that you are the hope of glory. That inside of you, when people look on you, that, and, and they know who you are, and they know what you stand for, they say, I'm not hopeless. There's hope inside of this. Because I've been changed. Because I've been transformed. Because even though I've been through the fire, I've come out to the other side and I'm still standing. Because I behave in a certain manner when I'm faced with adverse conditions that I don't have to be reactionary the way that I've always been, but, but I can actually react with the power and the Spirit of God. That's powerful. That's compelling. That's what it means to compel, to bring them in to the kingdom of God. Let me show you that, that the kingdom way is better than the earth way. You see, my testimony is not all about the great things I've done in Jesus' name. It's about the great things that, that Jesus has done in me in His own name. The very things that He has done, that He has used me uh, to, to get accomplished. The things that, that, the example that He has made of me. The very fact, just think about this for a second. The very fact that I'm saved. The very fact that there's room for, for, for sinners like us, well, former sinners, because now we are the kingdom of God, amen, but that we are, are walking forward in the deeper things of God. You know, there's something that's on my spirit right now, and I said, even as I'm saying that, you know, sinners, we're not in the same classification as those who do not know Christ. Just because you know Jesus does not mean that you will not mess up. It means that you have an advocate with the Father. It means that there is one who will go before the Father and stand up for you and say, don't kill him yet. This is not the time yet. I am in the process of bringing this fully into the place of redemption. I am transforming him, Father. I am changing him. Withhold the lightning bolt because there's still time. It's still time. Give them time. Give them space. And I'll tell you what, you want to walk in victory, there's things that we, that we wrestle with in life. And God is saying, give that up to me. Put some oil on that thing. Rededicate it unto me and bring it into my kingdom. It will do my work. Understand that. Don't jack yourself up when you fall down. Just jack yourself back up. Amen? Prop yourself up. Encourage yourself in the things of God. God knows your heart. God knows your intentions. God knows your actions. God knows, God knows the results. But you know what? He is a God of mercy and He is a God of grace. He is a God that will take you from here over to there. Then we talk about building the altar and going for the altar of God. We've got to understand that that altar is mercy and it is grace. He is not just the God of the second chance. He is the God of every chance. He is the God who will keep pulling you up. Every time you do that moonwalk and slide back into that hole, He said, i I got, a, I got another hole for you. i got a better place for you. Amen calling us up into higher places. Hallelujah. 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 you got to understand that you are a vessel of hope in the earth for somebody. You're a vessel of hope, even among the saints, that you are a vessel of hope. And, and, and so this is where you begin to function. This is, you're, you're called to be salt and light. Did you know that? 
that you are called to be salt and light in this earth, and, and, and that the priesthood of God. I know I told you in, in weeks past that you can't be a priest by you can't be a priesthood by yourself. You can be a priest by yourself, but you're not the priesthood. But God has said that the priesthood is within you. The priesthood of God is within you. That, that when God comes and He takes residence, He's bringing the entirety of the priesthood inside of you. That you have the, the fullness of the gifts of God. They are available and at your disposal to execute excellence in the kingdom of God. To grab hold of it and, and just really get it and understand the, 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 the light. You know, the priesthood is within you. The light is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the priesthood is the gospel in action. That the light is the gospel. I want you to understand that the, the, the priesthood, you are the priests of the Lord. And so you are the gospel off the pages. That you, that you are in, in three dimensions. You know, that you, you actually step out and you're an example. This is what the gospel is. Let me show you. Amen? So we've got to trust the Lord. We have to be able to operate in the land of our assignment. Now, last week I was talking about the principle of, of, of drawing out the blessing of God, even from imperfect vessels. And I'm amazed outside of preaching. You know, one, of the, one of the great things about preaching is I get to say what I want to say. You can stay quiet. You can say amen or you can say uh-uh, right? But we ain't going to argue it is what it is, right? But then we get into these conversations and I'm trying to impart these godly principles and I'm saying, listen, you can draw, you can draw the water out of the stone. You can get the blessing from a place where it doesn't look like it's there and here's how we do it and how many times people want to immediately get off the topic. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to see it because they don't want to be reminded of their own imperfections. But I'll tell you what, the imperfections are there. Until we, we, we were all together in that place, moving on towards perfection, is what the Apostle Paul said, we will be moving into that place of completeness and maturity, but we will not be perfect until the day that we are glorified. Amen? And one day we will be glorified. One day we will be resurrected into new. So, so we're, we're, we're working towards this. We are uh, uh, moving toward it. Amen? And so we need to, to trust the Lord. We need to operate in the land of our assignment. And so... Um, we're pressing on. And so when I talk about drawing things out and, and impacting the world around us, this is not manipulation in terms of, of taking advantage of, of people for personal gain. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about moving things around, applying kingdom principles, sowing and reaping with understanding and working our, our, our interrelational uh, our interrelationships, being able to work together within these to bring forth the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Amen? The places where we use our understanding to be effective in influencing, uh, um, influencing the, the, the world around us. God's giving us wisdom and tactics to get the job done. He's preparing this world for His coming. And you are a tool and an instrument in getting this accomplished. And one of the most beautiful things is God doesn't use tools and throw them away. He builds them up. That they become an extension of His glory. That when we get our, our, our focus right, as Diz was talking about this in the offering, we get our focus right, you know, that, that we grow. We become something more than we could ever possibly be. If I'm only seeking God about me and about my situation, about my condition, then I'm only limited to me. But we're called not to be a priest, but a priesthood. That there's something more. There's more than you. There's, there's, and and we've got to realize that the way that we impact the world around us, that that'll benefit us. Romans 5, verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For... If by one man's offense many died, being Adam, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, it abounds to many. Talking about the saints of God. So even though uh, one man's sin caused many to sin because they lived by that sin, the same way it works, the righteousness of Christ we, is now imputed to us. That we become right with God when we become right through the ways of Christ, through the blood of Jesus. That when we, do, when we come to Him and approach this way, we get the grace of God. How many of you know what grace is? There's two facets of grace. One facet of grace is the mercy of God. But the other facet is the empowerment of God. We are now empowered to do things as though we had never sinned, as though we had never done wrong. We now operate by this grace. In verse 17, it says, By this one man's offense, death reigned through the one, 
much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. And what, that's what I'm trying to get at right there. That we will reign in life through the one in Jesus Christ. What does it mean to reign in life? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about being influencers. You know, when you look at a, a king or a ruler, that they have a lot of influence. When they say it happens, it happens. And that we are called to reign in life. We are to influence every aspect and facet of life by stepping up into what God is calling us to be, what He is empowering us to be, what it is that He's putting in our toolbox, what He's putting into our, 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 um, our, our, our weapons case, if you will, what He's put into our quiver, that, that He's giving us everything that we need to reign in life. And so we want to grab onto what He's got. We talked about compelling and dwelling and occupying. That's three aspects of life that we are called to step up into right now. That we are to be victorious in all things through Jesus Christ who is the Lord. That we are called to be above and not beneath. The head and not the tail. Have you heard that before? We need to be pressing forward and taking new ground. And so we talk about compelling. And, and again, reflecting back to the parable of the Great Supper. You know, there's three different distributions of what took place in the parable of the Great Supper. How many are familiar with that? I believe it's in Luke chapter 14. But, but, but this, this compelling, uh, the, you know, the, 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 a great man, a certain man, he, he had a, a, a big supper, had a great supper. And, and when all things were ready, he called for those to come who were called. And, and, and that was the first level right there. All of those who were called, all of those who were invited to be guests of this dinner. And if you remember, it was at one after another. They made excuses why they couldn't be there. And one had a wife. One had a team of oxen. Another one had a field. I mean, said, all, all these reasons. It's not a good time for me right now. I'm, I'm, occupy, I'm too occupied to occupy. i got other things that are more important. And then you, you had those after that. He said, well, well bring in all the, uh, the lame, the weak, and the blind. Maybe those who won't give you so much resistance. Maybe those who recognize that they have a need for what is being served at this great supper. Bring them in. And then when the servants went, they said, well, we brought them all in and there's still room. Do you remember what happened next? He said, then go to the lanes and go to the highways and, and go to all these places. And he says, and compel those who are there to come. And that's where we, we get to that stage. Now we're looking and say, well, we need to compel people to come to the kingdom of God. It, 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 it's, it's, it's in my heart so much because there's so many souls that are waiting to be saved. There are people, give me one good reason to come to the kingdom of God. And we should be ready to compel, to go and to reach out and to bring them into the kingdom of God. There's so many people I'm reaching out to even today. I'm like, you know what? You just need to come. You, just, you need to get over your, your situation. You need to get over your problem. You just need to come. You need to come to the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about just coming to church. I want you to come to church. Don't get me wrong. I think church is a great place. I think we have great music. I think we have uh, some great preaching. I think we have some great people. How come nobody's agreeing with me? Come on. And so, um, and so we work through that. But I'm saying, that's just a manifestation of the kingdom of God. You need to get saved. You need, you need to know Jesus. Amen. You need fellowship and communion with the Most High God. You need communion in the Word of God. You need, to be, you need a touch of the Holy Spirit. See, that's the only way you'll get through that. There's so many times we look at people's testimonies. Testimonies is filled with I, 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 I. And it's not all about you. A testimony is all about Him. It should be more him than I in every testimony. You know, when we learned that from, from the Apostle Peter, when the Apostle Peter preached, he preached the kingdom of God. He preached that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is him whom you crucified. This is him who you sent to death. And, and, and you chose the other guy over him. He said, and, and, and he got right into the nuts and bolts. And you remember what happened? They were compelled. What must we do to be saved? What, how do we come in? What, what must we do? Uh, repent and be baptized. Come into the kingdom of God. This is all you have to do. It's really not that hard, is it? We make it hard. But it's not really that hard. Just come and know Jesus. Just come on in. And so we walk to this point of, of, of compelling. And so um, how do we compel? It was interesting. I was doing a little study just on, on, on compelling and what com compelling is. And, and the biblical compelling, it says prevail upon them with prayer. With prayer. Prevail upon them with prayer. It says, uh, it's good counsel. It's entreating. It's, it, entreating is kind of like begging, but it's got more purpose to it. Pleading. Come to the kingdom. You need Jesus. You need to, to, to see things turn around. You need a right eternity. That's that entreating and pulling. 
And so I want to talk about compelling by your life. Compelling by your testimony, spoken, written, or simply demonstrated. Where is Christ in your life? And the problem is for many people out there, as they are seeing the witness or hearing the witness, Christ is not revealed in that witness. It's a promise for something that we cannot deliver. But Christ will deliver himself. Christ will introduce himself. He said that I am the way, I am the door, I am the gate. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Our job is to give a good introduction and then to work some discipleship so that we can give wisdom and understanding and demonstrate the kingdom of God before those some in the kingdom and some that are not in the kingdom. Some have diverse levels of understanding. Some have diverse levels of grace. Some have diverse levels of wisdom. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote that there's a diversity of gifts, but there's one spirit. And so we find our purpose. We find our place. And we go where God has called us to go. Amen? So we're going to talk about the revelation of Christ. So my first point today is this. Christ is revealed through spiritual family. Christ is revealed through spiritual family. So, let me turn that inside out a little bit and say you need to be part of spiritual family. Now when I'm saying this, I'm not saying you need to be a member of a church. Don't, 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 get, don't get this turned around. And don't twist it inside out. You should be a member of a church. That's not, I feel like this. I, I'm not saying you should have that, but it's important for you to, to, to put on spiritual family to put on the identity that Christ is calling us up into. He designed family. Family began with God. Family begins with God. It, from the very beginning. What is the name that Jesus said when you pray to God? Pray like this. Oh, Elohim. He didn't say that. The Heavenly Father. The Father is a member of a family. The head of the family. You know, you start to, to do a little study on I absolutely love when you start to look at some of the deeper things. And, and you know, the father means father. It is what it is. But, but, but the, the, the entomology of the word father in, in, in so many different languages, it means originator. It means source. At first I was like, where do you get this stuff from? Where do people get this stuff from? We start to actually look. You see, different cultures, different ways. You, you look how it all comes together. And you're like, it's the originator. The image of Father, our God. Amen. And last week was Father's Day. Praise God. I hope you all had a great Father's Day. I know I did. Still trying to work those calories off, and it was wonderful. Amen. But I issued a, a challenge to discover the strength of the biblical family structure. I, I, I find this amazing. You know, a, a family is so much more than a group of people related by blood and marriage. Hmm? There's a, because there's roles that are played in the family. That we all take up these different roles. And, and God has actually written, we will get to that in a minute, but, but he's written eternity into the hearts of, of, of every person, of every man, right? And so that internal DNA can be drawn upon. That what is in there, God will, will bring it out in very powerful ways. And times when you're like, I didn't even know that was in there. How, how many old fathers and mothers in the house found out that you were better at it than you thought? Anybody? Anybody found out you're not as good as you thought? Anybody else? God is as good as I thought. And he can draw out the absolute best. God will use somebody to pull out the absolute best of what it is uh, that you are and who it is that you are. But a family, a family is a spiritual institution and it transcends the physical manifestation here in the earth. Or in other words, we are, have, have family in the divine. We have family in the heavens. We have family in spiritual places. That's why we come to church and we're like, hey, brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, because there's a, a, there's a revelation that is in that. I remember um, when I first got saved, we're down at the, the little, little old church on Hospital Road, and, and, and I'm, I'm just starting to, to come to church that operates according to certain principles. And, and I remember the pastor said, Brother David, I'm like, I'm your brother? I feel, yeah, really? Because you're like, you huge. I'm like, little Old me. I'm, like, I'm like, your brother? And, I'm, and, and it ministered to me just to be called brother. I'm, like, I'm not one of y'all. But he should call me in his brother. 
that there's an impartation, the sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, you know, you ain't cousin, you brother. That there's, it's, it's making a declaration. Think about this. You're making a declaration of relationship over somebody else. And even without even fully understanding what is this relationship. And on the other hand, you're like, oh, be careful who you call brother. Right? The manifestation in the earth of family has been corrupted throughout history. Even the families of the, of the Bible. Uh, you know, you look at some of the patriarchs and some of the things that they did to have multiple wives. <laughs> and not a good picture of family. And concubines, that's even worse, right? Fraternal murder, I think that's a pretty bad example of family, Cain and Abel. You know, um, deception, they did bad to their family. Whew. How many of y'all are glad for grace? And you, know, you praise God for the grace of God that set things back in, in good order. But the institution of, of, of family is powerful. The spiritual assignment of family is powerful to those who walk by the Spirit. And so if you're not walking by the Spirit, you'll miss out on a lot of things. But when you're walking by the Spirit... You know, if you're going to be alive in the Spirit, if you're going to live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. You know, read by the Spirit. Discern by the Spirit. Uh, meditate by the Spirit. Understand by the, the Spirit. God's got so much more to give us. You know, as our Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote, but we have the mind of Christ. We have access to something so much deeper, the deep, deep, deep things of God. We have so much access if we take the time and we actually explore it. Amen? Proverbs 1.12. This is um, amazing. Proverbs 1.12, starting in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in His commandments. His descendants will be mighty in the earth, and the generation of the upright will be blessed. It begins with family right there. My descendants are my offspring. The generations are those that are coming behind. And so we, we, we praise God because we have a promise from God. How many of y'all love promises from God? Even if, I, even if I can't see it, I still have the promise. I, I do the way maker. I love when you do that part. Even if you don't see it, if you don't feel it, it's still working. Well, even if you don't see it or feel it, you still got generations. If I don't have any children, wait, don't give up. I mean, don't, don't give up. Hold on, right? But men and women of God, mark this in your Bible. Mark it. Uh, mark it, highlight it, doggy ear it, exclamation point, asterisk, whatever it is that you have to do so that when you flip back through your Bible again, that you'll, you'll stop here. And you're like, this is a road mark. This is, a, this is my favorite road stop as I'm moving through the Psalms because there's a promise here for my family. There's a promise for the next generation. And so whether you are married or single, whether you have kids or not, uh, there's a spiritual manifestation for those who are mature in Christ and operate in the deep revelations of God. If you have, if you have been with this church for any uh, uh, amount of time, a few years or whatever, we always talk about the spiritual growth and maturity. And, and one of the, the parts we get to is that of a small child in, in the Lord, a small child in Christ. And we, we understand that when you become a small child, you begin to understand what your family is. It's then that you begin to realize that your earthly family is not the same as your divine family. And it's not the same as your spiritual family. And there are mothers and there are fathers. But I'll tell you what, it's only when you get to that stage you understand God as Father and those who are in the body of Christ as your brothers and sisters. But then the Apostle Paul wrote it. And he says, you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. That there's a, a distinction between those who will give you information and those who will lead you through life. Yeah. Verse 2, the descendants on the earth will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. That that verse changes the climate and produces results in everything that you touch, everything that you build, everything that you reign in life over. How many of y'all believe on some level, yes, I reign, I reign in life? On some level. Okay, I will convince you before we leave. Verse 3 says, wealth and riches will be in his house. How many of you want some wealth and riches? In your house. Amen. And, the right, and, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light and darkness. He is gracious and he's full of compassion and, and righteousness. A, a good man deals graciously and lends, and he will guide his affairs with discretion. So th this is powerful. 
If, I, if, I'm, if I'm walking godly, I have access to a certain riches and certain wealth. You know, in another place in, in the Bible, it says that, that, if, that, that he who lends has power over those who receive the, the loan. And so there's a, there's a dispensation of power living in a godly family, a godly household. I'm talking spiritual household of God, a spiritual household of, and putting on that, that relationship that you have. I love verse 6 says, he'll never be shaken. Not going to be moved, not going to be knocked down, not going to be taken out. Amen. Uh, the righteousness will be an everlasting remembrance. This is the peace. This is the love. This is the sound mind that we, that we claim. And, and, and we, we claim this as a, a promise from the Lord. God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. That was Paul to Timothy. But where did he get it from? He got it from Psalm. And where did Psalm get it from? God's picture of spiritual family. That's where you grab Scripture and you don't hold it out like a fortune out of a fortune cookie, but you recognize the power of where it's come from. It's the power of the Spirit of God. Amen? Verse 7, He will not be afraid of evil tidings. In other words, He's not going to freak out when He gets bad news. Amen? His heart is steadfast in trusting the Lord. This is having endurance through hard seasons. How many of y'all are grateful for hard seasons? How many of y'all are grateful God gives you endurance through hard seasons? Amen. Amen. He can't give you endurance through hard seasons if hard seasons don't exist. Amen. There's a blessing sometimes in that mess. Verse 8, his heart is established and he will not be afraid until he sees the, uh, his desire upon his enemy. So his heart is established. He will not be afraid. And, other, and, and so I know it says until uh, he sees this, the, his desire upon his enemies, but he's saying the, the things that, that you endure, the things that the hardships that you go through, your enemy will have to endure that. You'll be delivered. Going through a place of, of deliverance. This is a great, great psalm to, to hold on to. And, and this, this psalm, for you who operate by the Spirit, this psalm is, is what I call an altar confessional. Or in other words, we have our tithe and offering confessional. And we speak that tithe and offering confessional week after week. And, and we speak that up before the Lord. It gets into our soul. It gets into our, our spirit so we can walk uh, in, in, in some kind of um, uh, strength and prosperity. But this, when you go into the deep places of prayer, you go into the deep places of worship, when you are seeking God and you're asking God to, to move or you just get into that place, I just need to hear your voice. I just want to hear the voice of the Lord. You can recite this over that altar and watch the blessings of God come down and hit your life and hit your home and hit your family, hit every, every place that you go. This, 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 is, this is written for you to have power and to reign in this life. Amen? Psalm 68, 5. A father of the fatherless and a defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families and it brings out those who are bound into prosperity. I want you to just get that into your spirit for a moment. That that's a part. See, this is what God says that I am in my holy habitation. But we understand Christ is the head, but we're the body. We are the manifestation of these words. We are, 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 we are becoming fathers to the fatherless and the defender of, of, of widows. You know, that's, that's putting on a, a, the, the, the parent, the father, but that's also putting on the, the, the husband, the husband role, being a defender of widows. Boy, can you imagine the power when we all stand together and we start to look at the defenseless and say, we can help. We will stand together. I will, I will cover you like you're my very own. The power the body of Christ can move in. And so we look at this in family. I want you to, to, to grab hold of this too. That a, a child's first exposure to the ways of God should not come from the church. A child's first exposure shouldn't come from a teacher. It should come from the mother and the father. It comes from the parents. I mean, that, there's an important role that happens. And then likewise, the same way, when you come and, and you engage in a church and a spiritual family, that the, the, the great mysteries of, of the kingdom of God should come from this family whom you know and whom you can examine and whom you can follow. 
that there's so many times we see that what people do is they want to grab hold of spiritual mothers and fathers that they will never meet. They will never touch their, their, their YouTube channels and their, their books that were written and passed around. But, but God has called us to have this interrelationship one with another where we are building up one another. And I say, you know, as much as, as people might need to be covered and touched, you know, the covering and the touchers need you too. We work together. It builds us up into something that is that much stronger. Amen? People will learn by your example. Kids will learn by your example, not only by how you behave, but how you relate to God. You know, I've seen and I've discovered and I've lived it that if you've raised a child, they don't do what you say. Anybody else ever experienced that? They do what you do in the long run. Immediately you might get an instant response, don't do that. But what they will do is they, will, they learn by imitation. They learn by imitation. You know, I, I just, I heard a great example of this, and I want to share it because it really touched my heart. But it was, it was you know, a, a father talking about his child. And he's saying that, uh, that, that from the time you know, the child was young, that, that, that money would come. He'd get money. They're, they're poor people. But, but money would come. And when he got money, when he got a check, when somebody gave him something, he would always lift it before the Lord and give thanks for it. Not like, a, not like we would, oh God, thank you. But the kind of thing where you get on your hands and knees, you're like, Lord, I didn't know how we was going to get through this, but thank you, thank you, thank you. You're a good God. And he said, what, what, what actually ended up happening was in a short time that when the child got money, he would come and kneel down beside his father. And they would give thanks to God together. And I think about the power Behind that, what are we teaching? What are we demonstrating? Same thing happens in spiritual places. You know, we, we, we come together, we come to church, and, and we have some new people, and, and maybe they're just coming into the culture of the kingdom of God, and they don't understand our singing, our dancing, our clapping, and, and why the pastor shouts the way he does, and, and all these other things. And, and so what are they doing? They're learning how to connect by watching those that are around them. That's how I learned. How long was it before I could lift my hands in church? I'm like, this, this is a sin. We're supposed to do this. I clapped in church when I was a kid. Boy, I'd get clapped after church. Why are you harassing them? But it's different. We learn by observation. Why is that woman so happy with God? How is it that the, I'm sorry, oldest woman in the church and throw her hands up and dance and shout and spin around. I'm thinking if I did that, my back would go out. But she got the Holy Ghost. She, so, and, and I watch that, I'm thinking, man, we, we, we got to dance in church. You know, and, and it, you know, it's not extra. You're not putting on a show. But what we do is we, we realize that when we praise and we worship God, that something is changing in the atmosphere, that things are, are happening, that there are things you can dance into your life and things you can dance out of your life. There's things that you can worship into your life. You're worshiping God, it'll, it, it opens a gate that will come in, and then suddenly there's no room for all this stuff to get in there. Power in how we learn. We learn by example. So it's not just in how you behave, it's how you relate to God, how you respond even to bad things. And then there's the deeper things. And the deeper things, we, we receive it through impartation. We can receive it by the laying on of hands. We can receive it because somebody sat us down and explained it to us. Because somebody who had understanding didn't fumble their way through it, but said, listen, this is how it is. I know it doesn't make sense to you right now, but in time it will. Or better yet, I know it makes sense right now, but in two hours it won't make any sense at all. Don't give up, come back. Amen? This is how the kingdom of God operates. So where does this come from? Spiritual family. The origin is Christ Jesus operating through the spiritual family to a place of victory. Oh, we pray for victory in all things through Christ Jesus who is the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. The Christ is revealed through spiritual family. Christ is revealed through these things. People say, I, I, I see you operating on a different level. What's the answer? It's Christ Jesus. You know what? I don't know a thing about Jesus, but I do want that one thing. I'll tell you about there was uh, many, many years ago. Actually, on several occasions. But because our daughter did the right thing. Because she behaved in such a way. And, and remember, she hang out with some bad girls. Didn't she hang out with some bad girls? 
and, she, and, 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 and they'll be misbehaving or whatnot. And then we're going to spend time with these, these children. And next thing you know, mama's coming to church. Like, why, why are you here? Why, why did you come? You know? And then so uh, I had to figure out why your daughter doesn't do what mine does. I got to figure out what's different here. And you watch families being saved because a child gave a testimony. I'm um, sorry, lived the testimony. Lived the testimony. So Christ is revealed in that. My second point is, I'll be very happy to know, I've only got two points today. Oh, was the first one good? Yeah. Second one is this. A Christ is revealed through the redemption of time. Christ is revealed through the redemption of time. Time, time, time. And time, time is a commodity. Did you know that? Time is valuable. Time can be bought. Time can be sold. Time is a, a currency of sorts. Uh, it's one of the most precious resources that man has been robbed of. That mankind has been robbed of. Time. Your time is precious. It's a currency. That's why we use expressions like that bought me more time, right? Like, like, what are you doing? We're spending time. Sometimes we're wasting time. It's all money, right? It's like, it's like tied like a currency. And so there's a, a, a powerful concept the Apostle Paul mentions twice in his letters using the expression of, of um, redeeming time. Redeeming time. And so I say, whoever or whatever controls your time controls your destiny. Whoever or whatever is controlling your time is controlling your destiny. And that's a powerful concept. I, I, I ache sometimes in, in, in sharing this because sometimes my time is out of control. When God has control over your time, He's in control of your destiny. When man has control of your time, He is ruling your destiny. When you're managing your time, it's in your hands. And God gives this to us, and, and, and gives us the ability to navigate through some things. Now, I'm not going to talk about natural stuff. I'm talking about spiritual stuff. I'm talking about stepping in, in, into a spiritual time slot and being able to manage the time that we have before us. Listen, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 speaks all about time. I don't go through the whole uh, chapter. You can do that in your own time. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3 begins with, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Did you see that? That everything has a time. There's a time for, for all kinds of things. Verse 2, a time to be born and a time to die. Or another, a time for life and a time for death. A time to plant and a time to pluck what's been planted. Verse 6, jump down. A, a time to gain and a time to lose. And that, isn't that good that sometimes there's a time set apart to lose? It's a time to keep and a time to throw away. You look, you look at these, these concepts, and sometimes it's like, you just wonder, well, what time is it? How much time do we have? What season am I currently in? Why is there a time to lose? Because there's gain sometimes and loss. Because you wouldn't understand gain without loss. Because you wouldn't understand uh, uh, death without life. And you wouldn't understand life without death. That there are the, God's in control of all of these things, but everything will have a time and a season. But I also look and I see uh, here that, that there's, time when, when there's, there, there, there's times when time can be a powerful ally. And there's times when time is a ruthless enemy. Time. Time can make one wealthy. Or time can destroy all that you have. That's why Jesus told this rich young ruler. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? Sell all you have, give to the poor, that you will have treasure in heaven. Right? This talked about this in the offering song. You know, he said, well, ru rust and moth cannot destroy. You know, rust and moth are indicators of time. These things happen over time. You, have you ever bought something rusty? No, it happens over time. Well, Dan, you bought a rusty car, didn't you? Yeah, okay. You're a bad example. <laughs> but for most of us, we wouldn't do that. But you know, what, but you know what, here's the thing. Dan understood the premise of restoring time. How does that work? Good save. Amen. 
But the, the, the very power of this, and so, so we, we look, and, and so this is what Jesus told the rich young ruler, um, rust and moth, the indicators of time, and the destroyers of earthly wealth. And so what was Jesus actually telling this rich young ruler? Don't waste your time. Get rid of all the stuff that you're, that you're hoarding. Sell, give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasures in heavenly places where, where time cannot destroy it. Where it will, where it will not be expended. Think about that. How would you like to have a bank account that never runs dry? You do in heavenly places. Now, I can't cash a heavenly check. I need currency. Amen. Jesus also tells the parable of a man who had a major harvest and decided to build bigger barns rather than to invest it or to, to share with others. He said, I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm going to have a life of leisure because my crop has come in. And, remember, and he says, and God said to him, you fool, like you're an idiot. This night your life will be required of you. Then what will happen with everything that you have stored up? God's not that concerned with that type of time. God is beyond time. He's outside of time. He controls time. He controls the, the seasons. He set all things in order. The days, the months, the seasons. He spins the things in order. He makes these things to happen. You realize this is who God is. But he has set it into the earth, and now he has put the, 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 the affairs of the earth into the sons of men. And so we, we understand it. So we, we actually have an authority to operate with time. I find that very powerful. Verse 9, still in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. What profit has the worker from that which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which men uh, which the sons of men are to be occupied. You see this? He's, he's, a, he's talking about all his vanity. He's, I, I've seen the tasks that they're supposed to be doing. I see, I see the things that they are supposed to be occupied with. And he's saying, something's out of order. Something is not right. In verse 11, he continues to say, God has made everything beautiful in its time, but he has also put eternity in their hearts that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Just, just understanding. Or... We live in the earth. We live inside of time. We have a birth date. We have a death date. We, 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 we operate this way, but God is so far beyond that. But what has he written inside the hearts of men and women? A desire for eternity. A desire for time that doesn't come to an end. A desire to, to, to have this in our heart so, so that we are not bound. The chain's broken because we have an eternal line that we live by. We used, to, we used to say that a lot in our tithe and offering confession. I don't know why we ever took it out, but I like it. We don't live for the dot, but we live for the line. A dot has a beginning point and an end point. We're not living for this line segment. We're living for the line called eternity. Amen? God has placed it in our hearts, a yearning for a time that does not expire. Verse 14, and he says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. I love that. I'm not talking about ruling and having authority over time. Whatever God does, it will be forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. God rules time, not ruled by time. And I found this amazing. God cannot lose time. We can lose time. God can't lose time. He said nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away from it. This is God's timeline. So God's moving, amen. So we have to learn to manage our time wisely. If you can't operate uh, in, in, in this place of the redeeming of time, you cannot walk in spiritual authority. You cannot walk in a spiritual freedom. So that's where we end up in this place. How many times have you said, I'm in a battle for time? I'm, I'm, I'm racing against the clock. I'm trying to get some things accomplished, trying to get some things done. But here's, here's the important part. I want you to know this and get it and understand it. It takes time to love God. It, you don't just like, I just love God. You can say it, but to actually do it takes time. You invest time. You spend time with God. It takes time to know God. How do you, how do you love somebody you don't even know? Not so much. You might, but not very much. But to really love them is to know them. And to know them, it takes time. Time in the Word of God. It takes time in prayer. It takes time in seeking. It takes time to preach. It takes time to hear. It takes time of preparation. It takes time. It takes time to think. It takes time to think of good things. 
Meditation takes time. You don't meditate for a second. But you meditate. It takes time to live a prosperous life. These are all things that we need. Now, you know who discovered this a long time ago? The devil. El Diablo learned a long time ago. You see what happened was when God created man and placed him in the garden, God would come in the cool of the day. Why would he come in the cool of the day? To spend time with man. And during that time, he would be built up. They got to know one another. They got to build this relationship. It was an expectation that there was an appointed time when God would come through the garden. And so at a point, at a time, where it was not an appointed time, a devil slipped into the garden. Caused man to sin. And the words that were spoken against man at that time, the judgment for his sin was that you're going to have to go to work. <laughs> In other words, we're going to take up some time. And we're talking about this a little bit, you know, in, in past weeks, that it, it's how we labor and it's how we work sometimes that causes a downfall in our society. It causes this downside. We've got to spend all this time trying to make ends meet. We've got to spend all this time trying to, trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, put gas in the car and to paint the house. All the things that we need to get done and, and have to get accomplished, it all takes time. And then at the end of that time, it's time to go home. It's time to chill. It's time to rest. You have nothing left. Oh, how the devil works through that. You don't understand that, you know, when Israel... When Jacob went down to Egypt, right, and the, it's, Exodus says that there was a, a day when, when, when Pharaoh rose that did not know Jacob, right? Um, Exodus 1.8 says that there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the, the, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we, right? They're afraid, right? They're afraid. This is, so come, let's deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened that in an event of war, they also would join our enemies and fight against us and, and so go up and out of the land. So they feared the people of God. They feared the people of God. And, and so what did they do? They, they built cities. And in the cities, they would produce brick. And so what did they do? They put them to work. So what do you do when you're afraid of a people? You enslave them and you put them to work and you keep them busy. Then along comes Moses. How many of y'all love Moses? Why didn't the Israelites really like Moses? Well, because Moses went into Pharaoh and said, I have a word from God. Let my people go into the wilderness that they might make sacrifices unto me, or that my people would come and that they would have fellowship with me. What was Pharaoh's response? These people have time on their hands. And they're speaking to God. From now on, they have to get their own straw. Think about that. So that they will not be idle, so that they cannot spend time with God. So I can keep them enslaved. A tactic of the enemy. And, and, and still, we, we, we still see it. We see it in, in, our, our, in our own lives. That, that, you know, how many times, honestly, I just say this honestly, how many times have you said, you know, that God, you know, tomorrow... We're going to spend all this time together tomorrow. These are the things that we're going to do. And that's when everything goes wrong. Take up your flat tires. Come on. Uh, a, a bill came in. You, now you've got to find extra work. Um, there's just all these well, crisis after crisis. These things that take up time, time, time. The enemy is after your time. But we're to build time. Amen? That when time is taken away, it robs our pursuit of God. It robs our prayer time. It robs our family time. That, 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 is, that is one of the biggest challenges. You know, a, a prayerless life, you will never get time back. I don't have time to pray. You don't have time not to pray. You got to get out ahead of this thing. You need to prioritize this thing. I mean, back when I was working many years ago, I never had time, never had this. But do you remember that, that uh, finally one day, I don't know if you were fed up or me, somebody was fed up. And, and it got to the place, I said, all right. And I went into my, my boss, and I said, listen, 
I need Wednesday mornings off. And I remember she said to me, fat chance, you know, that's not going to happen. And I said, I need Thursday mornings off. Every week, every single week. I, I, I want these four, this four-hour block. So, and every, every Thursday, we would go out to uh, International House of Pancakes, and, and we would have breakfast together. If this is the only time we're going to get, this is the time we're going to get. And we prioritized that, and it helped our marriage. Matter of fact, not only did it help our marriage, it helped my job. It, I, I could function better. I didn't have to be taking 20 calls a day, you know. I, I didn't have to do none of that. I, I could focus, and, and God blessed it because it was, a, it was a blessed thing. And also when we spend time with God, just that same way. I'm going to set that time apart. I'm going to do, no matter what, come, 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 come hot water or, or, or any other thing. I'm going to spend that time with God. And that's, we have a problem here because we have something called a cell phone. And because we have a cell phone that, that people have access to us 24-7, that's your fault. I would say it's your problem. It's your fault if you can't find time to turn your phone off. You own that. It's, it's, it's your responsibility. And so we redeem time when we are prioritizing. We redeem time when we redeem time, we make sure it was authority. Amen? So we look at this thing with, 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 with time. And Paul said we need to redeem the time. We redeem time when we prioritize. We redeem time. When we do, we make progress. We accelerate. Here, here we are redeeming time. And, and let me just, just jump forward. There's something a little, a little I got to get off notes. There's something different that takes place. When you redeem the time, you're making progress. Or in other words, I'm redeeming my time. Uh, so now I'm, I'm taking baby steps forward or I've now resumed course because I'm now operating according to this principle. You know, God says, Old Testament, uh, Joel, the, I, I will restore the years. I will re restore the years of the chewing locusts and the flying locusts. I mean, you understand that there's this thing about restoration. What happens, see, when, when God re restores time, he, all the time that was wasted is, is now in the past. And you, now you have now caught up to where you are supposed to be. And there's a powerful, powerful revelation that comes with that. So in other words, I'm not, I'm not just, you know, I just think, I, I, oftentimes I'll say, I'll hear people talk about, what do you wish you had done when you were younger? And if you're, most Christians will go, I, I wish I came to the Lord younger. I just wish I, I had done this one at, at an early age and, and all these things. And, 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 and I'm like, well, when you got saved, you know, praise God. But what would it have been like if you were younger in it? Who's a great evangelist? Had a, had, a, had a small meeting, and he was talking to other ministers and says, and, and they're asking, said, well, how was the meeting? He said, it was great. They said, well, how many people came to the Lord? He said, five and a half. How, do you get, have, how many people came? Was it five or six? He said, five and a half. And he said, well, how do you figure that? He says, well, five of them were children, and one was like an 80-year-old man. And five lifetimes and half a lifetime. You follow? Time. Time. But God can restore that and make it whole. That's, that's the point I'm getting at. When God sets it right, He sets it right. I, I was reading a story of, of, about a woman who desired a child. Have you ever heard these stories before? And, and she desired a child. And she cried out to the Lord for a child. And, and, and there was no child. And, and, and she said, you know, by this time I should have had three children. I should have had three children. This was my life's plan. This is where, this is where I, I had expected to be. And do you know what happened shortly after that? Triplets. Go on, follow, follow that. That is a woo, hallelujah, amen type of a moment. Think about this. Because what happened was all the lost time to raise the, the three, they all came at once. That's restoration. That's a powerful restoration. And so that's, that's the point I'm, I'm getting at. God will restore some things. What do we do? We repent. We turn back. We, we go to the place where we believe. We go to that altar place. Uh, and and, and we, we make a commitment and follow through. And sometimes it's exactly that. that was, you, you still got time to pray in the morning? I'm going to throw something else at you. Pray anyways. Do it anyways. Don't put God on the back shelf. Uh, dear Lord, please let me have a blessed day. Amen. But he said, no, there's something that's locking up my time. Discover what it is. Dislodge it. That's spiritual warfare. It's logic. Amen? Speaking of time. And in conclusion. Ephesians 
Ephesians 5.14. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, or walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That, that just to itself, why do we need to redeem time? Because the days are godless. We don't have time to play. So he's going to walk very carefully. Um, verse 17, do not be like the unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, which is waste, right? But be filled with the Spirit. Or in other words, he's saying, don't waste time. I mean, very, very, very distinctly. It talks about walk carefully. Be careful how you, how you uh, uh, treat one another. I believe it's in Colossians 1 where he says this. And then he says, redeeming the time. Or in other words, a lot of times when we are approaching and going after the deeper things of God. How many are hungry for the deeper things of God? I'm coming to a close. Give me an amen. Give me something. Amen. And then we're looking for that deeper thing of God. But a lot of times we can't quite get there because we're still dealing with all the shallow stuff. We spend more time repenting for acting like a fool when we could be pursuing the deeper things of God. So we shift and, and we prioritize. And so it comes right back to family too. It's right to the place where we are spending this time and we are building a family. We are spending the time to build a walk with God. We are spending time to bring God's kingdom into the earth. We are spending the time, we're investing our time that we can be stronger in the things of Christ so we can weather the storm, so we can stand against every wile of the devil. Oh, take a second, what do I waste my time with? Videos, man, I watch lots and lots of videos. I need to be up to date on things that you have no impact on. That's not really not affecting your life. You just spend time in the Word of God. The other place of reading it and putting it down is I don't understand it. But reading it until you do understand it. That's a read by the Spirit. Are people, I, I, maybe I don't read every scripture. Maybe I'm talking about stories rather than reading the stories. People get lost. In it. I don't know those stories. Look them up. I'll use it again next week. Look it up. Get it into your spirit. Watch where God will take you over to, what will take you into. There are some things, and I'll speak this prophetically right now. There are some things that God has placed in the spirit of men and women and children in this church. And, and you're waiting for it to come to pass, but waiting for it is wasting time. Invest in it. God, you, you, you're in a place you're saying, well, I would like to move in such a way, and God spoke a word, and, and you will operate and worship this way. Just start doing it. Start exploring it. Spend your time on that. Start spending your time in this place. Stop building relationships and friendships are going to take you into deeper places with God. Leave the shallow end of the pool alone for now. These are the kinds of things we spend that time. Watch what God will do. We've got to be talking about gifts and anointings. Apostles, prophets, teachers. After that, the works, the governments, the healings. I mean, all of these things. Everybody has a gift. Spend time exploring your gift. Know what it is. Know how it operates. So when the time comes and the bell rings, you're ready to step up and to stand in that place that God has called you to. Too many times people say, I just wish somebody would step up, man. I just really, in the meantime, that was what you were supposed to do. But you weren't ready. But you will be ready. And you know what the beautiful thing is? I'm going to close. That's not the beautiful thing. The beautiful thing is God will restore the time. God will restore the time. You might have wasted a year. God will bring it right back next week. Bring it right up to time. What is the perfect time in the kingdom of God? When all things are now ready. So when does that release come? When all things are ready. Not just when you're ready, when all things are ready. Pray for the things that aren't ready. Pray for a release. Pray for a move of God. Pray for a move of God in somebody else's life. Pray for, pray for somebody that comes in and their appointed time had passed, but yet they can still be saved. Pray for that person. Find them in the Spirit. You may not know them personally. Find them in the Spirit. You, you go to that place now, God will begin to reveal to you. He wants work done. And what's He doing? His eyes are roaming to and fro all across the earth. And what's He looking for? To show Himself strong. To whom? For those whose hearts are loyal, who are devoted to Him. He's looking in a place called devotion. 
that's where he'll find you. How will he know to look there? There'll be a fire. There'll be smoke. There'll be incense. There will be a vibration. There will be a living sacrifice. There will be wells of living water. This is the outpouring of the presence of God. This is the outpouring of obedience to God. This is the outpouring of the priesthood. This is the evidence that the priesthood is present. Amen? Are y'all blessed? Are y'all ready for Christ to be revealed in your life? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Who's slow today? Let's pray. Amen. Can you just begin to praise Him right where you are? Just praise Him right where you are. We just love you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you, Lord God. Christ, be revealed in me. Be revealed. Be revealed inside of me, O God. That, Lord, this is a day, it is a time, it is an hour, O God.